Gentlemen, uh, we're, go ahead and continue. Grab some coffee, come in and sit down. We want to get started. We've got a, a very interesting program that we have this afternoon. I, uh, and by the way, I'm vamping for time right now, as they say in the entertainment industry. Uh, Stu Eisenstadt had a commitment that's going to keep him away until about 2.15. So if I do my normal bloviation, we should have just roughly the right time between him arriving and the substance beginning. Uh, and then I can, get, I can get away. Thanks for coming. My name is John Hamry. Uh, I'm delighted that all of you are here. This is kind of Steve Shroggy's maiden voyage here at CSIS. For he's, Steve is the sole shareholder here on international business and trade. And we wanted to pick up this agenda. This is, this is uh, probably the biggest question facing. I, I ask metaphorically, you know, if you were to go up to Congress right now and ask them, do you think trade is the problem causing our recession or the pathway out of it, I'm not sure what the answer would be, you know? And probably yes, it, but uh, I hope too many people are going to think about it as being the cause and the prolonger of this recession, where in fact I think we need to start thinking about it as a pathway out of this recession. And we're going to try to have a conversation with you all today about that. We're very, very fortunate to, to have Bill Brock and Carla Hills and soon to arrive uh, Stu Eisenstadt, who are going to lead us through this conversation. It, uh, the quality of a session like this, of course, is all is, is dependent on you. I mean, the questions that you're going to ask, they're going to give you a wonderful, insightful set of comments, but it really does depend on you coming forward with your very good questions. So, Steve, let me turn to you to get this going for real. Thank you all for coming. We look forward to hearing this session. It's going to be great. Thank you, Dr. Hammer. Um, I'm Steve Schrage, as Dr. Hammer mentioned, the new Scholl Chair in International Business. And one thing under Dr. Hammer's leadership as we confront this new, really unprecedented global economic crisis that's going to require a lot of new thinking is we want to reach out to people on you know, a bipartisan basis, leading thinkers in the business community, policymakers, um, and the academic community to look at new ways of going forward. And I think we couldn't ask for a more visionary group of leaders than we have here today, soon to be joined by Stuart Eisenstadt. They're people that have really had strong results and made some of the path-breaking uh, advancements in the trade community. Is that a little bit better? Yeah, there we go. And, and it, it builds on a couple different efforts we're looking at launching at CSIS over the next couple of months. One, looking at the strategic implications of the financial crisis, which is obviously economic. But as you see protests from Iceland to China, uh, the new DNI, Director of National Intelligence, saying it's our number one national security challenge, it's clear this is going to have broader ramifications that we're going to have to take into account. Second, how do we unite to build a stronger and smarter America, both between business and government, which I think has clearly been seen in terms of government having to act in unprecedented ways over the last couple of months, but ultimately, the private sector is going to have to fuel the growth out of this crisis and also paying down our debt. And then finally, and, and one of the key topics we're here to talk about today is, as our trade and international systems come under more strain than they've seen in over a half century, how do we build new foundations both to weather this and future storms, but build a new foundation for global prosperity and security as people did in the wake of World War II? And with that, I, I really don't think we could have asked for a better panel here today. Um, it's, it's more than to say they were present at the creation. They were really driving and led and spearheaded the creation of some of our major international economic institutions that we have today. Um, and as we look at back on the things that they've done, I think it's truly striking. I mean, we've had a couple of years where it's been very difficult to get progress on trade. But you look at what Senator Brock has done at USTR, and I, I really credit him with the vision of holding this event months before the election was decided, and we've seen the rise in protectionism, seeing the threat of the growing economic crisis, and also the need to come together across the partisan lines to chart a new way forward on trade. He's uh, a distinguished senator, led USTR as a father of the Uruguay Round that created the WTO agreement, and also some of the first U.S. Uh, free trade agreements that were really groundbreaking. Um, and he's continued. He was the, the Secretary of Labor, which is a critical issue for trade going forward. And then also he's continuing to work today on some really cutting-edge education issues that are critical to our competitiveness. Second, we've got Ambassador Hills, who is also a legend and a visionary leader on the trade issue. She pushed forward the uh, path-breaking NAFTA agreement, was awarded the highest award possible from the Mexican government to a non-citizen, the Aztec Eagle. 
and has been a legend in trade and business communities since. But her accomplishments go far beyond that. She was one of the first women secretaries in the cabinet and a previous administration. And she's also been a pathbreaker. She, like Bill Brock, is a trustee of CSIS, a co-chair of our International Advisory Board. Um, and we really look forward to her work on that and also some of the things she's done in a wide range of areas, including chairing the National Commission on U.S.-China Relationships. And we're going to be joined shortly by Stuart Eisenstadt, um, Ambassador, who, you know, unfortunately had to be away shortly, but will be joining us in the next few minutes. Um, he's also got a very wide-ranging experience. He worked in the senior levels of the Commerce Department, in the State Department, Deputy Secretary of the Treasury when the G20 was founded, and really has spearheaded efforts across the Atlantic with the transatlantic relationship and, and defusing things like the Helms-Burton Agreement. So with that, um, I'd like to turn it over to our panel, to uh, Senator Brock, for his initial comments and, and dive into these issues that we have facing us. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, first, thank you very much for being here. I, I think uh, this is probably the most challenging time that I can recall in the last 75-plus uh, years. Uh, certainly in the last 45 years of engagement in politics and government, we are beset by more challenges in combination than uh, we've had, certainly, uh, certainly since the Great Depression. And in a setting like this, it, it really is hard to keep your sight focused out on the positive side of things. It's, it's awfully easy to get into a defensive posture and hunker down to the point where you uh, let things get worse or maybe make them get worse. Uh, people too often talk about the Smoot-Hawley tariff of the 1930s and how that exacerbated and, and deepened the, the Great Depression. Uh, today we're more sophisticated. Uh, we have devices that uh, impede trade uh, without calling them protectionist. Uh, we, 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 are, we use all kinds of tools, whether they be subsidies or, or non-tariff barriers of, of various sorts. The, the, the problem is that um, in a world where, without almost any exception, uh, countries are, if not in free fall, certainly facing significant declines in their GDP this first time I can recall uh, where there's been a worldwide decline in GDP. The, the pressures are enormous on people in politics to, to uh, do some things they probably know they shouldn't be doing. But you've got uh, 100,000 people protesting in the UK. It's not just a few uh, people protesting in Iceland or Ireland. Uh, Sarkozy in France, others. Uh, are finding it very difficult, if not impossible, to resist the pressure to buy American, to buy French, or buy whatever. And I, I think the thing that I'd like to at least uh, draw your attention to right now is how hard it is to get people to think about taking a more affirmative direction when they are personally battered. Uh, the, the challenge of trade, is, as we were talking earlier, is that pain is very personal. Now, benefits are very subjective. They may affect the, the country at large, but pain is something you feel in your family or your business or your job. And somehow we've got to change the conversation away from that uh, that negative approach and, and think more, more broadly. If I may, I just would give you uh, one example. Carl and I have, over the, the last several years, talked about uh, whether or not trade adjustment assistance uh, is the appropriate response to, uh, to people that are affected by, uh, by unemployment. I'm not sure it matters very much why you're out of work whether it's technology or uh, changing market patterns or uh, outsourcing or insourcing, you ought to work. And yet by talking about trade adjustment assistance as if trade were the issue, 
we get people to think that, in fact, that is the problem. So we have uh, this wonderful tendency, which is uh, rife in American politics. You know the old rule, if you if you got a problem, find somebody to blame and be sure they can't vote your district. Uh, that's the way that we think about trade too often. And the country now is that one of these wonderful points where uh, despite our, our enormous challenges, we have the opportunity to think anew about whether or not we have put the grand bargain together between those of, those of us who believe that our, our economic survival depends upon a global economy that is vibrant uh, and in which we can participate fully without barriers uh, in, any, in any direction, between those of us who believe that and those of us who think the most important a task of any government is the human development of its people. Uh, we're not doing very much of the latter. Our educational system has fallen from 1st to 29th in the world. People have passed us uh, in terms of the performance of our kids. Uh, our workforce, most of the people are going to be working 20 years from now are, in the, are working today. And we're doing precious little to take uh, the opportunity, almost the negative opportunity, of four million new, new, new additional people out of work to provide them with a very different level of not just unemployment compensation, but of, of education and training to raise the skill set of this country back to where, we're, where we were not too many years ago, number one, in terms of the quality and, and educational level of our workforce. We're still the most productive people in the history of the world, but we're riding on past investment not just the GI Bill and the National Defense Education Act, but uh, a very good higher education system uh, and community college system that's carried us uh, further than sometimes we deserve. I, I, I raise that issue because I do, I do think if we're going to have a conversation about trade, it's got to be broader than just the, the absolute conversation about whether or not we don't like barriers in the in China or, or Brazil or some other country. I think we've got to, th to make this conversation one of what do we do? What do we do as a people to restore this country to its preeminent role in having the most educated, the most skilled, the most productive workforce in the world? What do we do to give those individuals who have those talents and the that entrepreneurial instinct, that willingness to work, to give them the opportunity that a globally advanced world with rules that allow for the free and full exchange of goods and services, uh, give them the opportunity that that kind of world affords. Uh, I think, from my perspective, that a new president facing an extraordinary challenge at home uh, has an opportunity to pull this country together and focus us on a much more positive direction. If we can start presenting uh, global trade as an area of opportunity instead of a threat, if we can position it as one that demands of us an improvement of the skill base of the people of this country, as well as a removal of barriers overseas and a set of rules that allow us to engage in, in free and full trade, uh, if we do those things, if we have an administration and a Congress willing to, uh, to take those initiatives, uh, it may be the single most important step we could take to recover from our present economic malaise. I think that's worthy of, of some serious conversation. Thank you. Well, you hear the answers. Let me listen. <laughs> Well, as uh, Bill said, we live in challenging times. Uh, according to the IMF, world growth has ground to a virtual halt this year. It has, uh, the IMF has slashed its projections made only two months ago from, uh, for the advanced economies, including our own, that they will all contract. And, they've, and the IMF has cut the forecast for global trade for this year, 480 basis points, expecting trade to be a negative 2.8 percent, marking the second largest drop in 60 years. And according to our Labor Department, 
more than four million Americans are out of work in uh, January of 2009 as compared to January of 2008, <coughs> and the losses have infected just about every sector. Nor are the emerging markets spared. Most economists, for example, predict that China's growth will fall to five to maybe six percent this year, a big drop from its double-digit growth over the past three decades. Now, six percent sounds pretty high to the American ear, but China's leaders believe that their country needs to grow at 8 percent to maintain domestic stability. And the shrinkage, the shrinkage of global demand and the evaporation of trade finance has resulted in the closure of thousands of assembly plants and factories in China. Urban unemployment there now tops 18 million. In addition, 20 million Chinese uh, migrant workers are, have been laid off, and more than a million college students cannot find work. Now, some say here in this country that until we fix the economic crisis, we can't talk about trade. But first of all, I was asked to talk about the future of the trading system and to mention China in passing. But more importantly, I think that I would argue that, tool, uh, that trade is one of the tools that uh, could help extricate us from our current global crisis. Now, it's not a silver bullet, uh, but increasing market opportunities uh, that will generate some growth, which in turn will boost some confidence, I believe will help. And over the past year, increases in our net exports have accounted for 100 percent of U.S. growth. Also, our trade agreements have helped to create commercial alliances to support critical economic and foreign policy objectives. Finally, other countries are not standing still. They're making alliances, and we need to be sure that our economic interests are not disadvantaged. Now, we have three completed bilateral trade agreements, Panama, Colombia, and South Korea. They're pending before Congress, and they would give our producers and our workers a break by reducing tariffs and expanding market opportunities that would make our products less costly in their markets. And that is particularly important for small and medium-sized businesses that constitute 97 percent of American exporters and account for roughly a third of our exports. These small and medium-sized businesses are the backbone of job creation in the United States. And our country needs to have regular, high-level dialogues with uh, China. Few Americans appreciate that China is uh, the largest holder of our securities, but in context of trade, it is also the largest market for our exports and our fastest growing export market. Since 2000, our sales to China have increased 300 percent, a growth ten times faster than the growth of our exports to our next largest trading partners. Virtually every state in the Union has seen a triple-digit growth in its exports to China. Over the past two years, our ability to resolve economic issues with China has been enhanced by bringing together senior-level cabinet officials of both governments on a regular basis under the process known as the Strategic Economic Dialogue, whatever it's called in the future. I hope that the new administration will put in place promptly the means to exchange views regularly with China's leaders on a wide range <coughs> of economic challenges. And we need to bring the Doha development round, a multilateral trade negotiation involving 153 countries, to a successful conclusion. These negotiations have been li on life support for months. Yet economists have calculated that the offers already on the table, so often called meager, would give a boost of $120 billion annually to both developing and uh, developed nations. And we should seize on every opportunity 
to enhance economic growth. Also, a failure of the Doha round would put at risk our credibility uh, in a rules-based multilateral regime that we work so hard to create. As the largest economy in the world, we gain enormous economic benefits from an open uh, base, true, an open market trade system, and the regime also advances global stability, which assists us through its support of transparency, rule of law, and respect for property, and by providing a means to resolve trade issues when we have differences with any number of trading partners. Global demand may be depressed, but with supply lines globalized more than ever before, the adverse effects of restricting trade across borders is greatly magnified, and that is why the Prime Minister of Canada, our largest trading partner, reacted so strongly to the Buy American provisions in our stimulus bill. And when you stop to think about it, it really makes no sense to uh, when, when our aim is to maximize American jobs, to refuse to buy competitively priced steel and iron and other components for a project when doing so would enable us to build more projects and provide more jobs. And it is particularly senseless where we know that to encourage uh, protectionism will cause an echo effect. Other governments will follow suit. And it doesn't make our discrimination any less offensive to trading partners for us to say, well, we won't discriminate against those few countries that are signatories, as are we, to the WTO procurement code, which prohibits discrimination in government procurement. Many large economies uh, are not signatories to that agreement and hence are subject to our discrimination, including fellow members of the G20 that met here on November 15th, like Brazil, China, Indonesia, and India, with whom we pledge directly that we would keep our markets open. And it's ironic that in the past, our government, including several members of our Congress, have proposed that the WTO members adopt stronger rules with, to limit uh, for, uh, the kind of state aid to uh, domestic enterprises, and to that end, have sought more aggressive enforcement of, uh, of our trade agreements. Currently, WTO rules prohibit export subsidies and import substitution, and we have frequently invoked those rules against others. But now we're in the uh, uh, dock, and Brazil has announced that it is considering whether to bring a WTO case against us. And it would not be surprising to see other countries join in. The G20 heads of state will meet in London on April 2nd, and their objective is to discuss actions that leaders of the world's largest economies could take together to respond effectively to the ongoing global economic and financial crisis. A strong, unanimous statement on an agreed course of action that mapped a path toward recovery, followed by concrete action demonstrating a real commitment would give sagging global confidence a real boost, and completing the Doha round would constitute just the right concrete action, in my view. Thank you. Why don't we start with a few questions while we wait for Ambassador Eisenstadt to arrive. You both mentioned the, the risk of protectionism and the Buy America Clause, and the, the G20, as you know, when it met last year, made a very big point about saying that there should be no new protectionist measures that was really more honored in the breach than in the adherence to that call. Uh, given the Buy America provisions, the, the call for British jobs for British workers, and this new type of protectionism that we're seeing percolate around, what is the risk of kind of the downward spiral that some people have noted that we saw in the 1930s, and what should we do about it? Are there things the G20 can do, the WTO or others can do to be more robust in preventing that kind of cycle from taking hold?
President's new Secretary of Education uh, is the Superintendent of Chicago, and he has described, as has the President, uh, their new approach to education. They call it the race to the top. I love that uh, expression. Uh, it says something pretty important. The problem with the G20, uh, in my judgment, is that uh, it's awfully easy to get together and make some really nice, feel-good statements without any substance behind them. Uh, I think we saw everybody make some well-intended statements in the previous session uh, and then proceed to violate them, uh, all in logical response to domestic pressure. The, uh, the conversation that Carl and I had uh, earlier uh, when we talked about the Buy America provision was responded to by uh, uh, some of those in the uh, in the staff of some of the congressional committees by saying that uh, the one change that were made that was made before final passage was that uh, we had a unanimous agreement from all parties that nothing in that provision would violate our present agreements. Now, I haven't seen that language, so I, I take uh, the individuals at his word, but I do think that. Uh, if the Congress is willing to live by present agreements, it would be a, a very nice new day. Uh, we seem to find a way to, to get around them too often. The same is true of countries. And uh, it, it seems to me that uh, the G20, which is a relatively new institution, uh, could become really important if a couple of things happen. First. Uh, I don't think we ought to have any more meetings unless the product of those meetings is a specific plan with specific, with specific components. We will take these steps to achieve these purposes. Uh, and I'm not sure that they have to be in the field of trade so much as they have to do in, 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 in the sense of, of working uh, in collective enterprise to restore uh, the global growth. You can't talk like that without talking about trade. But it maybe is, is a bit of a broader conversation. Uh, secondly, uh, I do think, uh, I heard um, Carla say uh, earlier uh, that she thought China was ready for a serious conversation in this regard. I, I, I very strongly agree with that. And maybe we should be talking to China and Japan about uh, taking a much more active either bilateral or trilateral uh, approach to rallying the world to a more constructive approach. Now, that to me would, would put some real flesh into the G20. It would provide the leadership that, that uh, does not seem to be there yet, uh, certainly on the part of Europe, and uh, offer people something to get, I think, excited about. Well, I've already said that I thought that uh, the G20 should have a plan, and one step there where they could move forward would be Doha. But I agree with Bill that uh, it could be much broader. The important thing is to have a strategy, and then unlike November 15th meeting, to have a real step forward, an action, something people can say, they did that. I happen to believe in the G20. I've worked with 153 in the broader trade agenda, and every nation has an ax to grind in commercial activity. These G20 are the big economies. We've got Brazil in Latin America, China in Northeast Asia, uh, India in South Asia, Indonesia, the largest Muslim country in the world, besides Europe and Japan and Russia, which needs to be brought along. and. It may take some bilateral discussions before the G20 meeting where we talk about what is it that you need. We're all in a very dire economic circumstance. It wouldn't behoove us to listen to what are the concerns of each one of these, or at least a good segment, and develop a partnership as to what plan could they swallow, what step could they take. It could make a difference. But we are now so heavily globalized that unless we move together, we're going not to be able to conquer the problems that are, have infected both our financial systems and our economic systems. 
Ambassador Hills, you mentioned some of the developing world, Indonesia and other places. And before the financial crisis, there was a great deal of concern. There was just exploding unemployment rates and population bases across the Middle East, across most of the developing world, apart from sub-Saharan Africa. And with the global economic crisis hitting these nations especially hard, what do you think the impacts are going to be in terms of the ability of the United States and other nations to come together to address those threats, whether through aid or through expanding trade? And how important do you see that in the days ahead? I think that uh, we have to move on all fronts, trade, development, assistance, and uh, a broader opening of our markets on education. Trade, for example, when you talk about poor countries, poor countries in Africa, Bangladesh in uh, uh, northern South Africa above uh, India, uh, Indonesia, Pakistan, a majority of those people make their living off the soil. Our restrictions on trade in agricultural goods are five times higher than trade in manufactured goods. Today, Bangladesh, a poor country that's suffering mightily, pays us five times more in tariffs for a fraction of trade that than does France. The tax on their exports to us are slightly above 15 percent. The tax on France is slightly below 1 percent. We should fix that. Doha would fix that. But we could also do some things with the G20 on this subject. And uh, besides trade, we need to support our international organizations. Japan has just given $100 million to the IMF. The World Bank is moving forward to help with development. But the G20 could address this topic. We're in a very dangerous time where people are apt to, if they were without job, without food, and watching their families suffer, will take actions that will not be positive to the United States. So we need to have a global plan, and we need our global colleagues to be part of that plan. And that's why we need to reach out bilaterally and regionally, as well as globally. We're nearing a critical time with the new administration coming in. The President's tomorrow night is going to give his first State of the Union-style speech. We've got a new U.S. Trade Representative who will probably go to a hearing next week. Uh, so a lot of people are still looking to the administration to see what direction it's going to take on trade at this early stage. As the President and the new USTR come into office, what is the one critical piece of advice you would give to them? And what is the one key message you would stress that they need to give in their public statements coming up? When Bill Buckley was running for mayor of New York, they asked him what he would do if he won. If he won, he said, "I'd demand a recount." <laughs> uh, there are times when uh, the new president must feel a little bit like that, with all the stuff that's on his platter. Uh, you've got a president that is probably the most able, articulate, effective political leader, certainly in the last uh, quarter of a century, if not more. He has a unique ability to rally people, to motivate them, to restore a sense of purpose and hope that is very special. Uh, and you, I think, I hope everyone else will pray that uh, those talents are brought to bear quickly and consistently through the next uh, years of his time. If you look at the challenges in front of him, the administration has been very clear that they are economic. The danger in that is that we tend to think that these are domestic challenges, that uh, we're the only people suffering, we're the only people losing jobs, we're the only people losing income, we're the only people whose 401s are going down in value. Uh, and that leads us to think uh, internally about what we have to do. I, I, I would not for a moment argue against a stimulus package. I would certainly argue against the composition of that package uh, as it uh, came from the Congress. But, but the need for us to take some effective and aggressive action 
is patently obvious. But once you've done that, then you've got to turn from the, positive, from the negative to the positive. This is a wonderfully appropriate time for the President of the United States to say, whether it's tomorrow night or in the immediate future, that one out of five jobs in America is affected by trade. If we are going to recover from this malaise, we can't do it alone. We've got to have markets overseas. We've got to remove some barriers that exist to our products. We've got to live in a world of rules in which people are honest enough to abide by those rules. We've got to take a new role, in a much more American role, uh, of leading the world to restore our jobs and our hope. To do that, you cannot talk about domestic recovery. You've got to talk about global recovery. That means global trade. You've got to start positioning things like the Doha Round as an opportunity to give the workers of this country a chance to get their jobs back, to compete, to grow, and to get the incomes that, uh, that we've come to expect in this country. If I had one message uh, that he could focus on, it would be to turn this this crisis into a serious talk about how exciting it can be if we take a more positive role and create a world system, I would focus on the, on the Doha round, uh, that would allow us to regenerate uh, growth and restore uh, our preeminence. Ambassador Eisenstein, would you like to and we're, we're, we're addressing the question of what would be your one piece of advice to the president um, and what public message would you urge him to say, but we're welcome to provide your opening statement as well. I'm sorry for uh, the delay. Uh, I want to start with the, uh, the proposition that we are really in a very new paradigm. We have, for one thing, the, the first truly global recession in our lifetime in which Europe, Japan, and the United States, all the three engines of growth in the developed world are in a uh, simultaneous recession, something we have not seen. So the question of which of the three large countries or entities can pull the world out uh, of uh, a global recession uh, is very much in question. Second, this will be the first time uh, in certainly modern history in which all the growth that will occur in 2009 will be outside the developed world, will be in the emerging markets. 100 percent of the growth, such as it will occur at all, uh, will be uh, in emerging markets in the developing, uh, in the developing world. Uh, there will be a global uh, recession in which growth, according to the IMF, will be uh, for the first time again in, in, in memory uh, in negative territory, but to the extent that there is any positive growth, it will be outside the three uh, uh, major developed uh, entities. Uh, that being the case, there has to be a global response to a global problem. The ferocity of the uh, recession worldwide has caught virtually everyone by surprise. If we were here only a couple of months ago, we would hear the developing countries and emerging markets talk bravely about how they had decoupled their growth from that of the United States. Um, and that the uh, trade between and among developed countries was strong enough, regional trade was strong enough, so that while they would have some impact, they would be buffeted. Uh, by the uh, recession, which, uh, which in effect started here and then spread to Europe and, and in Japan. And we now know that that is not the case. Uh, I was in Singapore and Malaysia a couple of months ago. Singapore had uh, at that time cut its growth estimates from about 7 to 3.5%. And, a half percent. and uh, in discussions last week with people from Singapore, they're now expecting a decline of minus 4 percent and maybe more for this year, maybe even as much as minus 10 percent. Uh, Taiwan had the uh, worst uh, quarter. Uh, their uh, exports went down 48 percent in the fourth quarter, and they're looking at a significant recession. 
Uh, now, certainly China and India are going to keep their head above water, but their growth rates, uh, again, will be significantly uh, compromised, meaning that we really are in a global uh, world. We are in a globalized environment in which all of us have to work together. So that being the case, what then can we do? And the time for this will certainly be in following up what I think was a good initiative by President Bush in, in calling for the G20 summit in mid-November. There will be a real question, first of all, of whether the G20 meeting, which will follow up in April in London, is sick, simply a one-time event and whether the G20 will then go uh, onto the uh, shelves of history or whether it will replace the G7, uh, which we've had in different forms going back uh, to the 1970s. My guess is that we'll have both. I think the G7 has a role to play uh, to try to get some consensus among the industrial uh, world and industrial democracies going into the G20, but the G20 is here to stay because the world has changed. And uh, we simply cannot avoid having uh, a seat at the table and a major equal seat at the table for the key emerging markets. That presents, however, uh, also challenges on their part. It's one thing to have a seat at the table. It's one thing for them to want and deserve greater voting rights in the IMF and the World Bank, to have uh, a G20. It's another thing for them to be responsible stakeholders and fulfill the responsibilities with go, which go with that. If I look back at at least two negotiations in which I've uh, had some role, the Kyoto uh, Protocols where I led the U.S. delegation uh, in which the developing countries took the position that this was all the industrial democracy's problem and they were going to take no commitments, which remains in essence their position still to today. And the impasse that we had through this summer in the Doha round uh, where uh, India and China essentially uh, refused. One could argue that the U.S. might have gone further, but still, they were certainly key components in not agreeing. We have to make sure that as we create this G20 as a permanent entity, that it becomes something more than a mini uh, U.N. General Assembly, that it becomes a, a vehicle for actually making decisions, that the dialogue, the interaction between the G20 countries with the different perspectives that we have by giving emerging countries an equal seat at the table can actually lead to something other than division and impasse and finger pointing. I hope that it will. I believe we have no choice but that it will. Now, in terms of our immediate agenda, what can we hope to come out of the uh, G20? First, an agreement on a coordinated fiscal and monetary stimulus. Second, each country, of course, doing it in ways that are best for itself. Second, to deal with the global imbalances. That means that the U.S. has to save more and China and other emerging markets spend more domestically. Third, to have a forum, and I believe that the framework that was set up in mid-November uh, in the communique is the beginning of that, not one global regulator, uh, which uh, no country will agree to, certainly not, uh, not the United States but rather the notion of a college of regulators that meets on a regular basis, exchanges information about risks in their financial system, looks at ways to harmonize uh, and synthesize regulation, and looks at ways to avoid what I would call regulatory arbitrage, in which the U.S. takes very tough positions on regulation, tough, tough positions because we didn't take them when we should have uh, some years ago, but other countries feel that this is a great opportunity for them to, to, to remain lax in terms of regulation, hoping to get banks and financial institutions to relocate to uh, uh, countries with lax regulations. That really has to be avoided at all costs. And then what brings us here immediately today is the, is the trade and protectionist argument, which I know that Carla and Bill have made very effectively. Uh, but if we look at what happened at the first G20 summit where there were great uh, ringing declarations, that each of the major countries would avoid protectionist measures. And then uh, at, at what actually has happened, with the French president taking the remarkable position that as a condition 
of getting uh, aid, Peugeot and other French automakers need to, to retrench and move their facilities from other EU member states back to France. We look at uh, the uh, demonstrations in the UK of uh, uh, British jobs for British money and then the Buy America provisions, which were happily uh, modified by uh, the intervention of the Obama administration, so they have to be consistent with WTO standards, but are still uh, on the books and send a, a potentially very negative signal. We have a lot of work to do, and we have to make sure that in London that these uh, steps away from the declarations in, in mid-November are called to attention and retracted. And second, as uh, Carla and, and uh, the Senator have indicated, we really make a push to get the Doha round done. That, that would be a tremendously positive signal that we're not going down uh, the road of the 1930s, that we are going to take what is really, at this point, relatively low-hanging fruit. We know we have to probably go through the Indian elections in May, but there is no reason why we can't reach an agreement. Uh, we're very close. They have to do more once we do that, get the agricultural piece. The developing countries need to do more for uh, the so-called NAMA industrial tariffs, more on services. Uh, but this would be an enormous way. Uh, one way to think of it is a multi-hundred billions of dollars of free tax cuts without any increase in the deficit of any country in the world. That's really what it is. It is a free tax cut, a free stimulus for the entire world. And it would be an enormously positive thing to go along with the other items that we've mentioned. So, you know, trade has a major role to play, as, uh, as both the ambassador and, and the senator said. The G20 is, is going to be perhaps the last opportunity to make that case, because if we can't make it then with all the key countries in the room, it's not going to be made for the next couple of years, and we're going to slide into a very, very serious situation. Can I just add one thought? I, I, I couldn't possibly agree more. The thing that scares me to death is how urgent the problem is and the need for us to be prepared to do something dramatic and do it very quickly. You're trying to operate within a fragile political system not only here, but in other countries, particularly China. And governments are going to be asked to put their neck on the line with some pretty tough decisions. But I, I, I can't possibly emphasize enough uh, Stu's point about uh, uh, this particular forthcoming meeting. I think the, the opportunity is, is, is huge for us to take a very strong lead and to make an enormous difference. I think missing that opportunity would be, uh, would be very frightening in terms of its consequences for, for our recovery. And to do that, uh, we've got to do some of the things that I think uh, our Secretary of State has been doing for the last few days in Asia. Uh, I, I frankly like very much the fact that she was engaged in what she was calling a listening tour. You can't have a conversation if you don't listen. There are a very few number of partners uh, that will be in that G20 meeting that we could have, uh, with whom we could have, or with which we could have a, a very quiet conversation. What do you really need? What do we really need to put a much more positive uh, uh, product out of the G20 session? Yeah, we'd like to open up to some questions from the audience. I'm not an economist, so my questions may be really sort of dumb. I'm a social anthropologist by training. I look at I look at, at what the pain issue is about work, and that if you talk about trade and don't get the think about what are the jobs that people have to have in order to create whatever it is you're going to be trading, and I keep wondering what we're supposed to say. Well. You read in the newspaper that we have all this surplus of cars and nobody wants to buy these cars. They're too big to sell anywhere else. I mean, each one of these, it, the devil is in the detail. And, and if, you, if you paint it with this big 
brush and you don't think about each one of these piece parts, I don't know how you get to something that's actually going to work. I mean, it's, what are we selling China? Are they buying washing machines from us? We're buying TV from them? I, I mean, I can't quite figure out what this, what it is they want to buy. Do we make it cheap enough that they want to buy it? I mean, I, I, and you have to explain it so the rest of us understand it better because just saying trade, I think that actually scares people because for me it's really about jobs. For them and for us. In order to have money to buy more stuff. And if we're saving, what are we producing? I mean, I, can you sort of pull this together so it makes sense for me? I'm sorry. With 5% of the world's people, we make 20% of the world's output. We need to find markets beyond our borders to sell our goods, and that creates jobs. I know you're not an economist, but you make a very good point about how to make the discussion about trade meaningful to the American people. The Peterson Institute for International Economics has done a study that demonstrates that by opening markets since World War II, that we have increased our wealth in America by $1 trillion a year, which wor works out to be about $9,500 per average American family. That means if the mean income in the United States today is $44,000, it would have been roughly $10,000 lower had we kept our markets closed. So we have an economic benefit. And the benefit comes from efficiency. When we opened our markets north to Canada, and we opened our markets south to Mexico, our auto industry benefited. It bought windshield wipers from Mexico mm -hmm. and certain devices from Canada. And the actual product crossed the border eight times before it was completed but it was more efficient, less costly, and presumably a better product. And there are many, many industries. You ask, what do we trade to China? It's a myth that we trade junk to China. We do trade machinery, computers. Our top five uh, exports to China are sophisticated goods. They need them, and, and what we need to get is balance. Um, yes. We, our economic picture has been poor in recent times. We have uh, uh, spent more through the, our equity in our homes where we have refinanced, and we have spent money we ought not to have spent. And now we have to bring it back. But if we close down our markets, we will hurt not only ourselves, but those countries beyond our borders as we become less efficient and create fewer jobs. So trade is an indispensable element to economic growth through efficiency. And that's what we need today. And the does, does efficiency put people out of jobs? Uh, trade puts very few people out of jobs, but it is perceived to have been to the contrary. You know, we've had two years of campaigning against globalization, trade, and to some extent, China. In, 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 po in point of fact, it is not correct that trade creates jobs. It creates efficiency and entrepreneurship and uh, moving up the value chain. That's what trade creates, wealth, more growth. And some people are hurt, whether it's by trade or technology. You know, it's a myth that we have lost our manufacturing. Yes, we've lost manufacturing jobs, but we're still the world's number one manufacturer. We manufacture more than China. How many people knew this in this, uh, in this audience? I'll bet you there are uh, 25 or 30 that did not know that fact. The thing is that we're producing more manufactured goods with technology, so we do it with fewer workers. That makes us more efficient. I'm all for, just as the Senator said, to try to train people to move up the value chain. If we were still making buggies and buggy whips, we would not be sitting in this beautiful 
auditorium. So moving up the value chain is vital as an economic proposition, but we can't hold on to the past and do that. So some people, yes, are hurt. And the question how best to deal with both having the general economy rise and take care of the pain that is uh, inflicted upon a fewer number. And that's where retraining, wage assistance, portable health care come into play. And I heartily endorse the trade adjustment assistant, although I agree with Bill. It should have been called worker adjustment or make America competitive. And that program also has a retraining provision. Let me make two points. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, you, you're going to get hammered by three of us up here. <laughs> that uh, all of us, all of us share your concern and, 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 and are willing to, to say we ought to have more social anthropologists in the economic profession because uh, there's a logic to that. Two or three points. One, for every job that's lost to imports, nine are lost to changing market circumstance, changing technology. Uh, so uh, if, if you want to blame the future, uh, you got a problem. If you want to blame progress, you got a problem. We just simply have to prepare our people to meet that challenge, which means education and training. It means taking care of people who are unemployed, not just the kids in school, but people who are unemployed. Secondly, uh, Stu um, used a, a phrase that I thought was terrific. He talked about trade being a free stimulus. It is free. It doesn't cost us. I mean, we've got more deficits than the Lord ever thought could be put on this earth. And, well, maybe not the Lord, but the rest of us. Uh, and. Uh, we really have got a problem trying to work our way through this economic thicket. It's going to be very long and very hard uh, to, to come back from that. We are going to need more personal savings in this country. We've been spending our way rich. We've been borrowing money from China to buy their goods. You can't be any dumber than that. But uh, we've had a pretty good object lesson. So what do we do? We are going to have to rethink our personal habits, our corporate habits, our collective as, as a country habits. And, and find a way to open the doors for us to grow our way out of the problem. That's where World Trade offers an opportunity that almost nothing else does. Lastly, uh, back to your social, social anthropologist, since we started building this world trading system, we've given a billion people in the world the opportunity to come out of poverty. A billion people have come out of poverty uh, because of, of, of the economic opportunity that that exists. I can't think of a greater compliment to the people that we're trying to create this construct, dating from the Marshall Plan and forward, uh, than to say, what a difference we have made. I'd like to just add, uh, you obviously touched a raw nerve, but I, <laughs> I, 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 I really believe that we are in danger of losing the consensus in this country and in the world for free and open trade. Uh, we are because the losses of jobs for trade, which are real, although not as nearly substantial as uh, indicated, are much more visible than the gains for trade. But let me just add without reemphasizing points that, that Carl and Bill have already made very effectively. Number one, when we enter into trade agreements, whether it's bilateral trade agreements, regional trade agreements, or the Doha round, multinational, We are already starting from a position where our markets are much more open mm -hmm. to the countries with whom we're negotiating than their markets are to us. So in many cases, almost all cases, it's a no-brainer. We're opening their markets to our products because our markets, through a very variety of preferential agreements and so forth, we're already much more open to theirs. If anything, it's, it's leveling the playing field. Second, every economic study has shown that export created jobs pay anywhere from 25 to 30 percent more than average manufacturing jobs, not just average jobs. That th these are high paying jobs, so that the degree to which people are being paid for exports, you get very high-paying jobs. Third, Carla, you mentioned this at, at lunch, the very substantial percentage 
of the companies who export are small and medium-sized companies, not just the big giants. They're creating a tremendous number of jobs as well. Uh, and last is the point that, uh, that Bill made. We have a stake in global stability. And by creating a middle class in these countries through open markets, through opening their markets for us and vice versa, we create not only more stability in those countries, less opportunity for terrorism, we create middle class consumers who will buy our products. So, I mean, we, we just have sat back and let the field be occupied by those who make the other argument. We do need to do more. We might have, a, have to have a much more expansive adjustment process. We have to do more on retraining. We have to make sure that communities and others who are unemployed as a result of trade are taken care of. But we also have to make the case, particularly, that our market is already open. What we're trying to do in these agreements is open other markets to our products and even the playing field. from Business Times. I'm not sure that there is a need to reconcile because I think that trade does create jobs and uh, open markets are good for global stability and for job creation. It's not an either or situation. In fact, that's the trap that we've gotten ourselves into, the belie believing that somehow more trade loses jobs rather than creates them. It, it, it simply doesn't. And that this is a leg of global recovery. You have to have fiscal stimulus. You have to deal with the toxic assets on the books of banks all over the world. You've got to have monetary stimulus. But you also have to have open markets so that we create jobs. It's, it's an essential leg of a globalized situation, of a globalized recession. Um, it just, it, it, you'd have a two-legged stool without having trade as a component of an economic recovery package. Well, and let's be fair to the president. Uh, the the uh, truth is that this is a very different world than it was a year ago. Uh, he's not running in a primary. Uh, he's governing a country. And the world is a very different world than it was then, economically and politically. Uh, my guess is that there are going to be a number of adjustments from some of the statements made last year to the, to the real world that exists today. My guess is he's already started to make those adjustments, and I give him credit for that. I think we should. Thank you. Ambassador Hills. The implicit in your question is that countries believe that exports are good and imports are bad, and that's a, that's a falsehood. The fact of the matter is that we can become more efficient 
by importing the products that we make less effectively, even if we make them better than all the rest. If we spend our time addressing the, ish the, uh, the components that uh, we make better than anyone else, we will have a final product that is uh, superb. So we want to keep the markets open both to exports and imports, and India would benefit immeasurably. If India were re to reduce its tariffs by 50 percent, it would generate jobs. That's not my saying so, but that's what the Confederacy of, uh, of Indian Industry has done by study. And India has the highest tariffs across the board in Asia, and that hurts its growth and of its economy. I just like to say also that in terms of uh, we, we oftentimes don't focus on consumers. Consumers are the beneficiary of open trade. It saves dollars from your pocket that can be invested, saved, or spent on other things uh, by having goods that uh, freely flow at the lowest possible tariff levels. But it's got to be mutual. And this goes back to the point I was making at the beginning. There's no question but that China and India have very large uh, poverty populations, but they're also at a stage of development where we might not be able to insist, whether it's on global warming or on Doha, that they take exactly the same tariff cuts as we do. But they have an obligation to do more than they've done. And it will benefit their people as well. It'll make their industries more efficient, and it will make their and your uh, consumers have additional money to spend for other things if they can get access to the most efficient products. I think we have time for one last question. How about all the way in the back? My name is Frank Wiebe. I am an economist, and I appreciate you <laughs> representing the case as you have. Um, I'm a little more concerned about the politics and the, and the process going forward. Uh, if our message is accurately, but uh, but it will be perceived negatively that other countries have to do more, um, that's one that doesn't sound like it's uh, like it has a lot of prospects for success. I'm simply wondering if there's anything more that the U.S. can do to assume a, a, a leadership position. Are there any things we can do, for example, unilaterally changing our agriculture policy, the things that would be seen by the world? As, as really taking the leadership in opening markets uh, and stimulating growth. I, I'm sympathetic to that, but, but the practical world that we live in is that the, the Congress is under a lot of pressure right now. And they're going to say, I want some quid pro quo. Uh, we have an insane system of barriers to small and poor countries to their product that are, are, are in no way a threat to American well-being. Uh, we, we could do that uh, unilaterally to everybody's mutual advantage. Carla talked about that earlier. But the truth is, if you're going to talk about larger things, Indian uh, tariffs, which are, are, are extraordinarily high and, and we think unwise anyway, the great thing about a, something like a, a bilateral trade agreement, much less the Doha round, is it opens the door for the give and take that allows for a whole range of things to be put on the table where we really do make significant progress. And Stu is precisely on point when he says we've got far fewer barriers than almost any other country. We are already open. Uh, by taking it to Doha and, and letting the President take that as an economic boost uh, argument, uh, I think is, is probably the, the most politically logical way for us to proceed now. Well, you are an economist, and uh, uh, you know if we were to take these steps unilaterally, we would enhance our economy. But I do think that you're on to a point that we should broaden the message. We could talk about the fact that our market is disproportionately open, but other countries want access to the largest market, the largest economy in the world, and so there is a benefit. We can talk about the economic benefits because we can quantify what we have gained in the past from opening markets. And I think Americans would respond to the humanitarian aspects. Opening markets and bringing countries like Bangladesh in actually alleviates poverty and has a humanitarian impact. 
that also I think Americans would, would be responsive to the security implication that Stu has mentioned. You know, when you give a country like uh, Indonesia, which has very high unemployment, the opportunities to create jobs and sell products throughout the global trading regime, those people have hope and are less likely to engage in activity that would not only endanger the global stability, but our own safety and security here in the United States. So we've got a really good song to sing for trade. The problem is we haven't been singing it. I'd say uh, two things. The first is uh, you talk about unilateral actions or statements. One would be a, a very ringing declaration even tonight uh, that protectionism has no place in this world and is counterproductive to uh, a global recovery and that as president uh, he will take no steps that will add barriers to trade and will urge others to do likewise and that would be very important. Second is to say that he's going to instruct his a new trade representative to reach an agreement on Doha, that this is an important initiative. We were very close. There was a question of how you define for purposes of uh, India and China a so-called surge in imports that would allow them to raise barriers and that the President would say that he's going to instruct his trade uh, negotiator to do everything possible to reach a compromise on, on that issue so long as we can make sure that there are reductions for our uh, industrial and service uh, economy, uh, industries. So I think those two steps would be a very important uh, direction and leadership by the U.S. Thank you. I, you know, I could sit here and listen to these two all day. Uh, it's uh, great to learn at the feet of the master and miss, miss or miss. But uh, you've been terrific. We're uh, over our time already. Thank you for being here. We'll see you hopefully next time. Thank you very much.